sorry, that was room service. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining myself and Michelle this afternoon. Um, we are excited to talk to you a little bit about fundraising, um, the various forms of fundraising, and also how we see it um, thriving, and also some of the challenges and opportunities that we can expect to see as we move forward in the pandemic. So I'm Akila Inslee. Um, I am the CEO and founder of Invictus Strategy Group, and I am super excited to be here with each of you today. Hi, um, my name is Michelle Guapan. I'm the Midwest Regional Director at Act Blue. Um, sorry for any children shows that you hear in the background. It's not for a child, it's for my dog. Um, but super excited to be here today and just talk about fundraising. I think how we both got to where we are and mm -hmm. um, just the future of fundraising and how we can just get more candidates elected and help them raise money to do it. Absolutely. Um, so for you all, if there are any questions that come up throughout um, the discussion, please don't hesitate to just add them to the chat. Uh, we will be more than happy um, to answer them as we go along and make sure that those get addressed. Um, a little bit about how I came to be a fundraiser. Um, I just kind of fell into it. I've been in politics for about 15 years. Um, and over the last seven to eight years, I started getting really involved on the finance side, um, both through nonprofit engagement and also with candidates and really loved it. Um, I think that there is so much power in an ask um, and really building those strong candidate relationships as well as donor relationships um, because they are long-term for the most part. Um, you have an opportunity to learn what people really enjoy, what their passions are, the causes that they truly believe in, um, and where they stand as far as candidates. So you can always kind of align specific candidates with certain people. Um, and depending on if it is a local, state, or federal race, that can be hugely helpful uh, and impactful to help them ensure they have the dollars that they need to move their message and also voters to the polls. So. Um, I guess, Michelle, how what brought you to Act Blue and how did you get into this? Yeah, it's been, um, I've been involved in politics for 10 years now. Um, I started on like a local ballot initiative in Maryland when I was about 18. Um, and I started with organizing, like volunteered with President Obama's campaign in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and then started working on coordinated in Maryland and was in Michigan in 2016. Um, and then when I came back um, after Trump got elected, I was like, I actually need a break. Like, I don't want to work on a campaign. I don't want to work in mm -hmm. politics. Um, so I went to a nonprofit for a year and then started to get that itch again where I'm just like, what's next? <laughs> like, I, I miss that campaign life. Um, and a friend uh, who had helped me get jobs before, had I reached out and was like, hey, like, I think I want to get back into campaigns. And she was like, I want you to get back into campaigns, but I actually want you to get into fundraising. There's not a lot of people who look like you in fundraising mm -hmm. and it's a great avenue for you. Um, it's not field. It's mm -hmm. very different. Some would say they are on the like opposing spectrums of a campaign at some points, but you're going to love it. Mm -hmm. um, so I went and worked with one of the big fundraisers in Maryland and was there from the time, learned so much ended up going back in the field for the 2018 coordinated, then back to fundraising, um, working at a firm in DC, and then working for the attorney general in North Carolina with his fundraising. Oh. Um, and then went back to field again in 2020, mm -hmm. doing field and political for Senator Tina Smith. And after that, I think I realized I was like actually done with field. I was like, I have no more ideas. I have nothing left to offer in the field world. Like I came up with a field plan in the middle of a pandemic. I don't, there's nothing else I can do here. Um, and applied for this job at Act Blue because I think it just merges the mm -hmm. like best parts about field and the best parts of fundraising into one. I do miss the very nice, uh, like high donor parties. Those were always very fun. Um, <laughs> but and happy to kind of be at that middle point um, but not on a campaign because mm -hmm. the stress of the election is twofold when you're thinking both about like, are we going to win and how am I going to pay my bills the following month? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Yeah. That's always, um, that's something that I've learned to love and also kind of loathe um, about campaigns. I think um, 
it's interesting how that kind of brought you to this. I know like starting my own firm, one thing you said is there's not a lot of us um, or people that look like us in this space. And that was the exact reason why I started Invictus Strategy Group at the end of 2016. And we went live March of 2017, basically as a full-fledged finance and fundraising firm, working with like nonprofits, you know, candidates um, and helping them build strategy because it's so impactful to have reflective democracy um, where candidates can see people that have the cultural competency that's needed um, when they are both having, you know, these conversations, when they're meeting these donors, because that's not always the case with the messaging pieces and how an ask is made, depending on the background of a candidate. So I think that that's something that's so essential and can be very impactful. Um, is it Jono? Um, thank you both. Oh, Michelle, um, I also have degrees in political science and philosophy. Can you speak to how those degrees translate into fund fundraising work and campaign work in general? Yeah, a person after my heart. Um, Prado, thank you so much for your question. Um, I think philosophy, I will say, is a it's kind of like a Mad Lib. You can kind of like fill it in as you go. There's no, like philosophy can translate into everything and anything. Mm -hmm. um, I think on the political science end, there's so much data looking truly at like politics as a science around like why people donate, what causes they're willing to donate to, um, when people decide to donate, how to, like when someone is more likely to max out, how to get consistent donors, recurring donors, like there's so much data around that part of fundraising. And I think a lot of times when we are looking at fundraising, especially for a lot of us when we first start, where it's like, call this book of people, ask them for this amount of money. And then when they don't answer, you're gonna call them again next week. Like, I don't know many candidates who love call time, but they have to do it. Um, but when you're, I think especially with digital fundraising, you're able to really expand the different options and capabilities that the campaign has, whether it's through social media or um, you're using SMS to fundraise and just thinking through the data behind like when someone is more likely to respond, what the click rates are. Um, so I think that's kind of where the political and like the true like science of it comes in. Um, but I will also say like, I don't think you need um, either of those degrees for this work. I think a lot of times in politics, if you are like willing to learn and ready to do the work, people are gonna find you and they're gonna ask you to do it. And then you just keep moving up and keep doing the work. And fundraising is definitely a field where it's just a lot of learning and building. Um, and once you're able to kind of like build those connections and like sit through a call sign with a candidate, have them be miserable and still have them come back, it makes it a lot easier to just do over and over again. Definitely. What do you see in the digital world and that of email engagement with everything Act Blue is doing? Like as a fundraiser, I rely heavily on your like your tools um, and having Act Blue at our fingertips. What are the um, what are some of the opportunities and deltas that you've seen over the last two years with the pandemic? What has changed with digital engagement, and where do you see it going? Um, people love TikTok. Um, I think in the last two years, I mean, everyone had to move online, right? So I think mm -hmm. of some of like our older um, candidates who were used to doing like purely check fundraising, um, where they're having their like fundraisers, whether it's during the off season and out of um, session, or like they have like their three big fundraisers a year where people bring their like 50, 100, 300, maybe a couple max out checks. And like, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, and then last year they couldn't do that. Um, so they also had to figure out like, how am I going to navigate that? Do like, do I need to start an email program? Do I need to be more active on social in a way that allows people to connect with me and donate? Um, I mean, I think on the more like digital savvy side of the spectrum, it's now like, how do I navigate through all this noise? Um, because now everyone is online, everyone is doing something. So how do I still stand out whether I'm going against the like 
five time Republican candidate and like I'm just trying to get my name out there and get enough mm-hmm. tweets to like raise money on Actblue for one day. Or I've always been active on social, but now literally so are all of the other candidates. Um, so I think we're just seeing folks just really like throw things at the wall and try to see what sticks. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as soon as it does, you just see a lot of different campaigns kind of like remixing and repeating the same strategies. Mm-hmm. Do you think that moving forward, we're going to be leaning more on digital engagement than we are for anything that is based in like the more traditional side of things, kind of like what we're doing with like call time programming and like all of those moving parts? Um, I am a huge fan of call time. I am mm-hmm. a tried and true believer that call time works um, mm-hmm. and is amazing. Say that um, loudly for the people in the back. <laughs> Yes, like call time works, get your candidates to do call time. They're not going to love it, but everyone loves the money that comes out of it. Um, And like, it's very rare that you are Mm -hmm. going to get someone to max out over like a social media post. Like Mm -hmm. it could be, but like your big, like your max out donors, your consistent donors are like, you're going to get those through call time. Mm -hmm. Um, You're going to get great recurring donors through social media programs. Um, but like those big donors, you got to call them on the phone. Like, I mean, you can't ask me for $5,800 for a congressional campaign, um, over like a tweet, like I need you to call me and personally ask. Right. Um, but I think in the future, I think one of the things that we've talked about a lot over this pandemic is broadband access and how it's not just a rural issue of not having internet. Like you could live in a major city and have internet connectivity issues. And Mm -hmm. I think it is going to start to affect the digital fundraising space as you're, whether you're trying to flip a seated Mississippi or West Virginia or so many of these other places that we're trying to replicate this Georgia magic, how do you connect with voters who aren't in places that have stable enough internet to do a digital fundraising strategy the same way you would in Atlanta or like we think of it in New York where there are still people who don't have that same internet access. Um, so I think a lot about like, how are we doing mobile tactics? Like snail mail is still a thing. How are we doing good like mail programs? Um, and just thinking of all the different ways that we can layer that contact And I'm sure that's something um, in the traditional fundraising world that we think about a lot. Like after that call time, how do you follow up? How do you layer the approaches? Mm -hmm. So you bring up an interesting point. I think one thing I always kind of, and not that I forget, but like that broadband isn't everywhere. And I think that's something that was like truly exposed with the pandemic. Like you had like buses in rural communities, like, positioning themselves and, you know, so that kids could like actually get work done because they couldn't do it at home, yet they were still expected to like complete things. And I think the same does go for, you know, those candidates that don't have that type of access. And I mean, I think that's really where field comes into play because you have to like, you have to go back to your roots of like how to truly grassroots organize and like get on the phone and like dial for these small dollars and like set up recurring programs um, and you do house parties, virtual house parties, potentially now. But I know um, when I was working the 2018 gubernatorial, a great deal of the grassroots infrastructure that we built was done through house parties. Yeah. Where people would just get 10 to 15 people. We'd like do a quick little call, send them a kit and like just turn them loose and say, you know, let's raise a thousand dollars and let's get everyone to sign up. And then we would convert those people to volunteers and hopefully ask that they continue to give their 25 bucks a month. So there's definitely utility um, in that. And I think that um, as it becomes more available, I think we'll have to become more creative, but I think that the digital sphere, the metaverse per se, um, (laughs) provides us a lot more opportunities to really engage and connect with folks. I just feel that like, so many people are exhausted from like Zoom <laughs> because like we want to be outside. Like you want to actually have like that human engagement um, and you want to see people in person have those type of conversations. There's something that's so different about that. Um, when it comes to this, we can all get, you know, uh, fairly distracted or you can be doing other things. Like we hope that everyone is giving us their full attention, but someone's on their cell phone. 
figuring something out. Somebody's listening in the background and working. So we're like quasi a podcast. So it's kind of like all of these different things. Um, and I think that there's going to be a lot of fluid movement. What are your thoughts on the midterm for next year? I, <laughs> I think midterms are always interesting. Um, putting on my like New York Times, the daily cap. Um, I always think of how like post uh, Virginia and New Jersey this year, mm -hmm. it became this, like, this is a preview of the midterms. What are Democrats going to do? How are we going to do things differently? Mm -hmm. um, and just this like diagnostic of where mm -hmm. the party is. And I'm not sure if that's necessarily fair, because I think if we look at the putting my political science hat on, if we look at the data, Virginia, like historically votes for the opposing party of the recently elected president. Um, and like Ralph Northam is actually an example of that. It, we were just excited it was Ralph Northam. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't matter. So, it was just like, yes. Yeah, we were like, yes, change. And it's like, no, this is exactly what Virginia does. Like Virginia is moving in the right direction, but like this is just their historical trend. Um, Goodness. So I think looking at next year, like we're all hoping that we are finally on like the other side of mm -hmm. this panorama and I hope so. not learning the rest of the Greek alphabet. Cause at this point I did not know a marathon was a letter um, in the Greek alphabet. Like we're all just hoping that we're on the other side of this and that there's been progress made at all levels of government. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we'll still be on a lot of Zooms. We'll still be doing a lot of virtual and like contact list events. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if we look back to the midterms of 2018, it was a lot of sine waves and new like digital tools. So if you're talking to someone on the street, you can like figure out what their van is and still be able to enter that data. Um, but if we're not standing in front of metros anymore, like how are we gonna connect with those everyday people who we're not easily able to capture on social media? Mm -hmm. um, and then now that everyone is constantly on digital, like how do you cut through all of this noise um, and help people see like what is going well versus mm -hmm. what will always be talked about more, which is what's not going well and what isn't being done. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the midterms are going to be really interesting. I've heard more about school boards in the last six months than I feel like. Has Local elections are so intense. Before. They're so intense. Mm -hmm. There's like a whole new level of interest. Um, and I'm like, I hope people know like a lot of school board elections were this year. So like, you should have paid attention a little bit earlier. Um, <laughs> but I think next year is just going to be one of the first times in a while that we're seeing interest in like every level of government. Mm -hmm. um, so it should be good. Um, how are you feeling about it? I am, I'm excited because I feel like 2016 was a mess we all and we've come through that 2020 i think it was like this massive sense of urgency yeah. it was like 2018 there was like this budding hope right we had like all of these amazing gubernatorial candidates and like we had all of these house seats like it was all of these little bits and pieces and we were just like yes and there was so much hope and then i think with 2020 it was like sheer fear and paranoia that like yeah. you know we have to fix this we cannot let this happen very much like what you just said about virginia like it was the like we have to do this one thing right but i think looking around that one thing i hope that we do not do is become complacent because i have my gut tells me all the time that do that so it's like we'll get back in and we're happy and we're like oh all is well when really there's still so much work to be done so i'm very excited to see a lot of new first candidates step up. some of these. they are excited to be running for congress um some of these massive ag races that are up for re-election we have several people that are running um i know what is it in vermont we may have um i think she's indian american um but she's considering running and then I we have some amazing like Stacy's back in. What? Um, you know, in the South, we have some really solid, you know, candidates that I think have true potential. I think there has been a great deal of fundraising side, like donor apathy this year. Because when you think about it, we didn't just end 
what was it, December 7th, <laughs> when we yeah. finally got like the election pieces all tidied up that Saturday when people were outside like banging pots and pans and dancing in the streets. It was beautiful. Um, you know, we then had to pivot very quickly to Georgia, which again yeah. is like going to be one of the top states to follow. I think, I'm not sure if everyone saw it, I actually sent it to someone today in a group chat. It's the only reason I'm picking up my phone. But um, in Georgia, uh, they have rejected ballot requests up to 400% after the new for Georgia voting law. So obviously voter suppression is going to be alive and in, like, it's alive and well. They are going yeah. to do everything they possibly can to stop us from exercising our rights, our voice at the ballot box. So I think it's, as candidates, they're going to have to dig in. They're going to have to be super creative because for some of these races, people, you know, it's like I'm introducing new candidates to donors and I'm like, oh, that's nice. Well, let me see what their filing report looks like. And maybe, you know, maybe in January I'll dig in. And I'm like, well, we kind of need it now. <laughs> we have to start building infrastructure now. Like the primary is in March. So if I don't get those dollars now, come January 1, they can't execute on the ground like they need to start doing with their field program, with like media, TV buys, digital ads, et cetera, so that they can make sure that like we are properly reaching everyone that we need to. So I think it's it's been a bit of a toss up for some. Um, and I am actually very excited also because there are a lot of candidates like Chris Jones, Arkansas, of course, Stacy, um, Danielle Allen, who is in Massachusetts, she's running for governor, um, and several other candidates. You've got, you know, first like a, another statewide is going to be um, Keith Ellison, who's running for reelect. We all know how impactful his work has been, not only just for the state of Minnesota, but really for setting precedent across the nation when it comes yeah. to criminal justice and making sure that people are, you know, getting fair and equitable treatment, but we actually see outcomes. We get to see the actual verdicts. So I think all of these things, you know, leaning back on their record, et cetera, are things that we can leverage as fundraisers. And I am eager and kind of chomping at the bit to see how January is going to turn out because it's starting to pick up. The momentum is, is gaining slowly, but surely. And I think the sense of urgency will start, you know, elevating in January, which will then help us better be able to fundraise, which helps you because clearly every contribution, I think I wake up every morning and check my daily report from Act Blue. And there's like Everyone? hundreds of notifications about Act Blue. I don't even care. I'm so excited to see those notifications. Like throughout the day, I'm like, oh, more money came in for this person. Or if there's an event coming up, I'm like, oh, I'm literally texting campaign managers like, hey, did you see? Like we got three max outs in. Like this is fantastic. Like I'm going to send them a quick note. I'm going to CC you. You should give them a quick call of thanks. Like let's make sure we're keeping this consistent. So I am optimistic about the midterms. Um, I hope that we do our due diligence in Congress. I think Build Better Back was a good piece. I think if they can keep pushing that, I am concerned about this Roe v. Wade piece. Um, I think that's also going to be a massive like driving factor for folks to like move their butts to the polls. I hope it is. Um, so we still have you know the right to choose. And you know I am just excited to be kind of in the mix. I feel like I'm always in the mix, but I think this is going to be one of the most critical elections. I think we say that every election, um, but I, I see it coming. So I'm just hopeful that the outcomes are what we need them to be going into these primaries so we can position these candidates well in the general against the Republican candidates, you know, whoever that opposition is going to be that, you know, we have diligence polling and actually show up for these people. Yeah. And I think you bring up a good point in like talking about the moment we're in. Cause I feel like so many times um, we do like that 2020 election. And then if everything that was promised isn't done in two years, we're like, we're not coming back out because you promised right. us all these things. So, you do them. so mm -hmm. like, I don't care. We're upset. Uh, like, we're literally yeah, angry. I'm like, yeah. Okay. And I 100% get how mad people are. Cause I'm like, you, yeah, you stood in line for hours. You donated money, you downloaded all these different apps in order to do like relational organizing last year and mm -hmm. volunteer and the things that were promised to you, like we don't have them yet. Mm -hmm. And like, you have to keep electing them in order to get these things done. Like it is very rare that anything happens in two years. Like right. what Obama did, President Obama did in the first two years he was in office. You literally is, took it out of my mouth. I was like, when we got the Affordable Health Care Act, 
and all of the um, recession bills. Like mm -hmm. that is not normal. It's right. normal that like maybe the Build Back Better Act gets done in like a two year span and then like you right. start working on the next big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is very rare that someone is able to accomplish that much in two years because there's just so many moving pieces. Other things are happening. Like we have to like, yes, hold everyone accountable and mm -hmm. we have to like give them time to get these things to work. Yep. Um, and stay involved. We can't just yep. say like, oh, I elected you and then you didn't do anything. So I'm not voting for you again. Like you gotta keep talking to them, keep asking, keep pushing. Mm -hmm. And I always say like, ask your elected official, like what can I do to be more helpful? Like is, is who should we be calling? Cause you right. say you're on board, but who should I, who should we talk to instead? Who seems to be a little on the fence? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's always the big ones I tell folks. Definitely. So we have uh, another question. What is our favorite thing about working in fundraising? The least favorite thing about working in, in, in fundraising? I would start with the least. I would say difficult candidates. Whew. It's like herding cats at times. Um, but I think there's also a beauty to this work because you have to adapt and adjust your process to every single person that you work for. No one is cookie cutter. Like cookie cutter is something that we attempt to do and it never fully works. You have to meet someone where they are. You have to figure out what their strengths are when they're the candidate and you have to figure out how you can make those pieces work. For instance, I have, um, I've worked with candidates that are amazing at the pitch, but refuse to ask. They will not ask. So it's like, I literally sit on conference calls or I've sat in meetings and I'm just waiting for the opportunity to be like, so thank you so much. What do you think? And we would like to ask you for X. Like right. you gotta be able to get in there and do that. Um, so I think when they're super difficult and extremely egotistically driven, it can be very hard because sometimes they'll work against themselves. Um, and you really just have to humble yourself. And, you know, as my dad would say, you gotta eat a little crow. Um, and sometimes you have to, you know, figure out a way to get something done by convincing someone that it's their idea, even when you bring it to the table, it, it works a lot, works almost every time. And my favorite thing is meeting all these amazing people and these donors. Um, there's truly something to be said. I actually did a meeting last week with someone at um, an organization that is extremely powerful. They hold a lot of donor, to, like a lot of donor relationships. It was a big deal. And she was very shocked that I was a black woman. And for me to engage her in that way and have her be like, wow, I need to know how you did this. And like, are there more of you? Because, you know, we need more of this. And like, I think it's, it's good because one thing I've always kept very high on like my list of priorities is making sure that there are more people that look like Michelle and I in these rooms because they're very few because we normally get slotted in field or on the political side, always. And it's like, very, oh, you know how to talk to your people, feel mm -hmm. for you. And they're like, oh, you know how to talk to your people. You should be in field. And you're like, I also know that my people like to raise money. And yes, all and they can also write very big checks. You just have to know where to find them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, you know, being in these spaces and making these amazing relationships, helping them see things through a different scope in a different lens. You have sometimes extremely progressive donors that are still very much conservative in their own personal thoughts and mindset. And to be able to challenge that in a really uplifting and empowering way, not only for me to share information, but for them as well, open to receiving it. It's truly a beautiful thing because at the end of the day, it's going to help continued funding for entities, organizations, and candidates, because they now understand the value of X, Y, or Z that they didn't, and they wouldn't have otherwise. There's like, they would not have. Um, so I think that there's something really powerful about being in this, this position. Um, you can be very vocal about a lot of things. Um, and, you know, you can truly change how people see the value of their dollars. Um, and how they want to utilize those dollars. And that is an amazing piece. That's an amazing thing. What about you? Yes. I feel like you took the word right out of my mouth when it came, uh, when it comes to donors. Like they, donors, like there's just such a vast spectrum of the different donors you meet on campaigns. 
um, whether it is like the CEOs and like really interesting, powerful people, some of which you're like, I didn't know that you were even politically involved at all, but mm -hmm. they just like get money and like back away. Or just like the small donor who's maybe on a fixed income or retired, but like loves giving money to candidates and mm -hmm. truly it's true. And like, they know that their five or $10 a month is equally as important as the person who wrote the max out check. Um, mm -hmm. And like, I just love all of the donors and they're also like, they're so sweet. Um, <laughs> I think for me, the least favorite thing was probably something I learned early on at the first firm that I was working at. We would have candidates come in and start working um, with my boss and they think they're going to get this like magical book of all of these like millionaires and wealthy people who are just gonna give them all this money. And my boss is like, actually, we need your phone. We're gonna dump out your phone contacts and you're gonna start by calling yes. your friends and family. Yes. And they are just like, I don't wanna call my mother-in-law or my college roommate. And we're like, we don't trust you to call the head of a labor union and ask for a max out and an endorsement if you aren't comfortable calling your college roommate and asking for 50 bucks. Um, and getting over that hurdle was always one of the more like frustrating and difficult things. It's like, I get why you're not comfortable doing that, but like we have to start somewhere and people who know mm -hmm. you are the best places for it. Like we have to get that early money from somewhere. Um, but that was definitely one of the most frustrating parts because people literally come in and be like, great. So where's the book? And we're like, can I have your phone? <laughs> yep. Let's start. Let's start there. Let's do your circles. Let's, let's get everyone, let's, let's get everyone there. Then yeah. we'll branch out and start bringing them. Um, exactly. yes. So how has the pandemic changed your philosophy or logistics for fundraising events? Oof. So one of the most interesting things I was working a U.S. Senate race. We had four U.S. Senate races last cycle and three congressionals in the 2020 election through the firm. And we had a senior statesman from Texas who was running the U.S. Senate and getting him to grasp the impact of Zoom was a lot. Um, they just wanted to <laughs> it's like, no, we can actually do this on Zoom. And then also getting some of like the OG like, donors to comfortable. I mean, ironically, now it's something we don't even think about. Yeah. Like we have all this technology, like we can work from anywhere in the world as long as we have Wi-Fi and we can like manage, you know, time zone. like we're good to go. It's just, it's not something I think that we had been forced to actually directly address so acutely so that we could pivot because when you think about it, March hit, everything was shut down by mid -month. and I think trickiest pieces was finding a tactful, thoughtful way to still ask for outstanding pledges and still ask people for money because I was calling that could normally write me a max out check like it's nothing. And they had lost someone to COVID. They had a family member that was sick. All their kids, like I'd talked to someone, four of their children had to move back in the house pretty much immediately because they were all in they were all in college so now everybody's back in the household like the entire dynamic is now disrupted right so i think it was super stressful i will say that like my philosophy became more of not necessarily being aggressive when dealing with you know donors in the sense of like you know i'm calling you this is clearly a political call i want to know how you're doing how are you to really being like how are you you know, and then closing with that soft ask of, you know, I totally understand that times are hard. However, you know, I am still required to attempt this goal for order. You know, thank goodness we had front loaded, but it was front loaded money, like front loaded the two months prior. So it could kind of dwindle and not necessarily uh, us on reporting, which nobody was paying attention to because it was in the middle of, it was the beginning of a pandemic. I, I genuinely, was going to be the walking dead like i was just waiting for like chaos to break um so it's one of those is where you know i had to be far more empathetic to everything 
and find really unique ways to still talk to people and really kind of give them their space and then have the, um, and really be okay, honestly, be okay telling a candidate, a senior advisor, a general consultant and a campaign manager, no, I cannot do this. I totally understand that you want to see this happen. We are not going to reach this goal. I think we're going to hit 25% of it. That's where we are. And that's what April looked like, April and May. June, of course, June, July, for those of you that may not necessarily be active fundraisers, it's always going to be slower months unless you're going into a general election um, and you know, you're kind of in the heat of it in the summer right before the election, but it's normally super slow. And really, you know, I found my voice. Um, as far as logistics, we got a system in place. I mean, like to this day, when we're doing a Zoom, like my staff knows exactly what to do. We have various trackers that like people have access to. You can see the money coming in. We send biweekly updates. You know your Zoom details. We let you know who's RSVP'd. We make sure everyone has it. We really just streamline that process um, to make it easy because I don't think at first we kind of knew, but once we got like a good rhythm and, you know, a good protocol in place, we just stuck with it. Um, I think the hardest thing I ever had to do was a concert. And then I had to do, it was with John early when Marquita uh, Bradshaw was running in Tennessee for US Senate. He actually did a comedy show for her live streaming on YouTube, but it was amazing, but it was the most cantankerous thing I have ever done because of all of the logistics of like streaming. And there was a band that was like, it was a lot. So, but I mean, I think we did our due diligence and our best. So I definitely gained quite a few best practices um, that we can now leverage long-term because clearly, you know, she's, COVID's not going anywhere. So, you know, we're going to have to continue to innovate um, and find ways to really just meet people where they are and engage them and hopefully not bore them to death. What about you? What do you think? <laughs> I feel like you covered like 99.9% of it. I think the only thing I would add is another thing that we saw last year was a lot of folks wanted to raise money, like their candidates and they're raising for themselves, but they also are trying to raise for local food banks mm -hmm. during um, the unrest over the summer. I think I was in Minneapolis. So like my view of everything was very like firsthand, mm -hmm. but um we saw a lot of folks want to pause for personal fundraising because like you turn on CNN and there are streets on fire. It doesn't feel like the right time to ask anyone to give you $5. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a great time to ask folks to donate to program to different organizations that are partnering with the youth or partnering with um, African-American communities. Right. Mm -hmm. So you now saw this influx of, um, 501c3 and c4 money going to mm -hmm. all of these charities and candidates having to find that balance between like when is the right time to ask for me and when is the right time to ask oh, for, for folks to donate to these food banks to donate to these different organizations mm -hmm. and what organizations because I think whether or not we want to admit it there is like a bit of political touch to this mm -hmm. uh, what organization should I be asking folks to donate to like, I don't want to put myself in a position where I'm asking someone to donate to an organization and then something comes out about that org and now it's reflected on me. But I also want people to understand that I'm not just worried about the campaign and I am actually seeing what's happening around us. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was one of the really interesting, both logistical and overall things that we saw come out of the pandemic were the, well, we're still in it, so it's not really come out of it. Um, but that we saw a lot of candidates thinking about how do I stay in contact with my donors and like keep them active, even if it's mm -hmm. not specifically for me. And mm -hmm. a lot of times just sending those emails, asking folks to donate to a food bank, the next time you ask them for $10, they're going to give it because they realize right. that you're like- You were there for them in that moment. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We actually had that happen. Um, we did a lot of that in Florida because um, the, actually the food pantries were like so empty. Um, Donna Deegan, who was running for the fourth congressional district, um, who's now running for mayor of Jacksonville, um, decided that uh, we were going to do that. And we had to like talk, of course, to the attorneys, but we figured it out. And it was actually really great because people actually love the fact that like 
she saw them. Somebody had actually said that they were like, you see where we are and like, we're hurting. And like, you've literally spent two weeks not asking us for anything and just yeah. sharing resources with us and where we can go to get things. And it was, it was really helpful, especially like at the height of everything. Um, it was really beautiful. And um, it, it also kind of helped us feel better because, you know, you're focused on something else that's positive and actually helping your constituency instead of just asking them for something. So that was really cool. All right, Robbie, can you walk us through your personal step-by-step -step process for call time? And how do you find donors who are willing to host fundraisers? So, all right, so my step-by-step -step process for call time, the first thing I'm going to do is Rolodex you. I don't care if you want to or not. We're going to pull everybody you know. I'm going to pull your emails from Gmail. I am going to pull the file completely from your phone so that we have a full spreadsheet. Um, and normally we're going to do that for your spouse or your partner. Um, we do it for both of you. And normally what I will do is set up spreadsheets um, or Google Sheets rather. And we prioritize those people right? So we want to pull everyone that you consider to be intimate family or in your inner circle. That's always going to be number one. Those are sometimes the absolute hardest calls outside of random people you went to college with or business associates that you don't know. Um, even business cards. If you have business cards, why are we not calling those people? You met them six months ago. We should call them and let them know you're running for office. We should ask them to support you. We're going to send them to the website and send them your prospectus. So once we do the inner circle, those closest to you, we then branch out to like the outer friend circle, colleagues, right? Then we're going to go to work. Um, then we're going, sorry, I can't do what they're saying. Then we're going to do professional organizations. Um, anything that you're involved in, that can be a, a, like associations for work. That can be um, associations or like if you're Greek, we want to know who that is. Like, are you part of an alumni association from the school that you went to or the, the specific, um, you know, program that you were involved in? All of those people can be helpful. And then from there, it's, I don't, not necessarily, it's like that outer, outer circle. So people that you've just come in contact with, right? Or, you know, oh, I met this person. They seemed really great. You know, they were super politically active. I, I don't know what the ask should be for them. Well, let's just call them touch base and let them know you're considering this. Let's see what their thoughts are. They may actually have something really impactful to say, providing you some opportunities um, that we otherwise may not have had or open doors to a network we wouldn't have been able to touch had we not picked up the phone and called them. This is a very difficult and sometimes long process, but you want to keep it to like less than like two weeks, if possible, because at some point you got to start dialing. You can go down the rabbit hole of people whose names are in your phone you don't recall. I normally section those off once all those people have been tiered out, and those are staff calls. <laughs> like, you know, we'll do the research, right? Because another piece with call time, you want to research giving history. So anytime you get a new list or you want them to call people even within their circle, they should normally a candidate can tell you, well, I know this person, you know, they do this for a living, you know, they vacation here, you know, she's got really nice this, nice that. Their kids are in private school. Now that may be, oh, they have a lot of expenses or you know what? They can afford to write me a max out check. So I'm going to be the person to say, let's ask for that max out check on the call. You're just going to make a direct ask. We do some role playing, right? We're always going to role play. And if that person's not comfortable making that full, you know, max out, nine times out of 10, they'll say, well, I should be able to do it over the course of the primary. And it's like, great. Can we have you sign up to be a recurring donor? Or would you like to split it up? You know, can you do if it's, you know, it's 2000. Okay, can you do a thousand now? That would really help me get off the ground. And, you know, maybe at the end of the quarter, at, in December, as we're closing out the year, we can come back to you. How do you feel about that? Okay, amazing. My staffer's sitting here. Her name is Akila. She's going to send you a quick email or a text message. Are you cool with her texting you? Perfect. I'm going to give her your number now. We're going to text it. Now, it can either be the staffer doing the text or it can come from that person. So that's what I do for call time. Once those calls are then made, um, I want to be mindful of time. Once those calls are then made, um, the next piece is tracking. Follow up is essential. Follow up, follow up, follow up. Hopefully within 24 hours. There's no reason you shouldn't follow up within 24 hours. Um, making sure that if there's anyone that wanted to host an event, 
They want more information. They need more time with the candidates. They want to figure out how to volunteer. They have someone they want you to talk to or the candidate, whatever it may be that you at least follow up with them with a nice note so that you can CYA, number one, you update your tracker. And then you keep that in the log until you can move them from still you know, needing follow-up and tracking when you actually made those touches to moving them to the completed track of, you know, they gave their money, they're going to host their events, they've connected us with these folks in their network, that type of thing. You have to be persistent. Um, a lot of things do have a tendency to sometimes to fall through the cracks. When people say, call me back in three months, I literally have to make a calendar reminder. I have to. <laughs> Because it's on a Google form and we've now started building out beyond where they were in the 10th row and we're now at 50. So I have to remember to go back. So I always make a slight reminder for myself um, so that I don't forget. And finding donors who are willing to host events. That can be um, folks in their network. It's always best. Go local and go close. Who do you have that we can pull together? What five people that may not have ever done it in their lives, but we can teach you how to do this. And not only are we going to teach you how to ask your friends, we're going to do conference calls with you to make sure you all are comfortable and answer all of your questions. We are going to provide you all of the tools that you need. We're going to write your template emails that you can edit and adjust to your voice that you can send out to your people. We've created your invitation. We have created your Act Blue link and your Zoom registration. If it's in person, we'll take care of all of that as well and we'll be on site. So I think it's really providing them those tools to give them the comfortability to know that like they're not set up for failure because a lot of people are like, I don't know what I'm doing. And quite frankly, there's some people I'm like, can you just give me your list? If you give me your list, I got you. I don't even need you. I need you, but I just need your name, right? So if you can just send this template email to all these people with me on it as a BCC and have a CC that Akilah is going to be reaching out to you directly, I will make sure to hit up all of these folks. So get a phone call and an email and we'll get this rolling. Um, and so that's like the internal piece. Uh, and then when you bring on some stakeholders like national leadership councils, et cetera, they want to host for you. Like they're all in. They're like, when are we going to get this done? I've got five people. And then depending on where they are in the country and the race that they're doing, um, you can really lean in as a fundraiser to big donors in those cities and also throughout the country to bring them together to actually host that fundraiser. And that's a direct ask for me. Or I will set up a call or have the candidate call that person and basically say, hey, you know, I'm working with Akila. She meant that you have such an interest in criminal justice reform and education. You know, those, those are two of my pillars in my background. I've done X, Y or Z. You know, I would love for you to invest in me and invest in this campaign. I'm going to actually be in New York City in two months, you know. Would you be willing to potentially host uh, a meet and greet for me or a small fundraiser? You know, a key little follow up with details, that type of thing. So it's a combination of everything. It's their network and your network. And you're bringing all of that together. And there are also times, um, there are also a lot of times when, um, what is it? Uh, there are a lot of times when, Excuse me, when you have the ability to make all of that work, and then if you need it, you can actually host events as a staffer, like where you just hold a meet and greet, or you hold a fundraiser and you send some emails out and some targeted phone calls to specific people, and you can raise, I did that twice this year for two candidates the lowest one raised 15,000, the other raised almost 35. And that was just us doing internal outreach because we wanted to make sure that we kept the continuity and the momentum and that we had some events scheduled in lieu of actually having hosts. So I hope that was helpful, Robbie. <laughs> um, that is definitely not as much my wheelhouse anymore. I do, <laughs> I miss call time. Like it was- really. Yeah, I mean, it, it It was painful at many a times, um, but at the same time, it was like one-on-one -on -one time with your candidate um, where mm -hmm. I would, I think one of the other things that I left out, uh, least favorite thing about working in fundraising, having to help your candidates understand that they can't have 30-minute phone conversations with Ooh. every single person that they talk to. Like, mm -hmm. our goal, we're here for three hours, I need 10K. You can't yep. talk to each of these people for three minutes. You get like so, five to seven minutes max. <laughs> yes. And like sometimes I refer for one candidate, we started using a timer and it drove them insane. 
they were like, if you do not turn that timer off, and I was like, I'm so sorry, this was a directive from my boss. Yep. So if you want to talk to her about not using this timer, feel free. He wasn't going to do it. Um, <laughs> but I think with host, um, cause this is something that we see in field as well, especially with like the meet and greets. Mm-hmm. Um, there are definitely like, there are people who just love hosting. Like they mm-hmm. might not be the person who's going to max out to your campaign, but they will put together a great party for you. And they know all of the local, like political people, the busy bodies. They're like, oh, you should talk to that person. They can host a fundraiser for you. I'm inviting this person. They have a great network of people who can knock doors for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so figuring out like, and then you're going to have other hosts who you can tell them like, we want to do an event and we need this event to raise like 30K. And they're like, okay, no problem. I'm going to invite my people. We're going to raise that money for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have other people who are like, I'll give you the house and the catering. But that's- figure it out. Yeah. Like you mm-hmm. got to do the, like the rest of the it work. To you. Um, or mm-hmm. I will book a space at a restaurant and send y'all the bill. Um, so you can, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, so you can expense it, but like, or do the in kind for it. But like, that's, that's it. Like, that's all mm-hmm. I got for you. Um, so it's like figuring out like what kind of host someone has the capacity to be um, mm-hmm. is rolling with it. Like, I wouldn't recommend hosting the, um, we're going to do this at a restaurant. And like, that is what I can offer you is like this restaurant and the person who is also just offering their home. I wouldn't do those in the same week. Cause like, that's a lot on your staff it's to stressful. build. A, like you're basically building two events. Mm-hmm. Um, versus it might not be hard to host the I am going to write and raise 30k for you Mm -hmm. and the person who's like you can have my house but like I'm not really going to do much else for you you can probably host both of those in one week um so it's definitely that combination Mm -hmm. completely agree um we are running low on time so if there's any last minute questions please add them Um, But just some key takeaways, you know, if you are looking to transition um, into finance, do so. It is not crazy. Do it. Um, I think one thing, if there's anything, also this ties into the philosophy piece, there's no time like the present. If COVID has taught us nothing, it is to live your life fully and on your own terms. So if you want to make, oh, I had it wrong. Um, But if you want to make... um, any adjustments, et cetera, it's completely fine to do that. So know that like there is confidence in yourself and basically it's just learning a different set of skills. And a lot of the times if you have the gift of gab and you can engage with people and you can be really fluid and flexible, you can be a fundraiser. Honestly, the bulk of my time is talking people through their problems, troubleshooting, finding creative ways to fundraise, And also, you know, really helping them be the best that they can be and also ensuring that my staff and those that I'm working with on the team that are in finance feel empowered to do their jobs and do it well, because otherwise we we wouldn't be able to thrive because Lord knows finance is like all things. It is a team sport Um, and everybody has to be playing their parts um, and sometimes crossing over and making sure that all T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Um, definitely same team sport. Um, I am a huge believer in like, sometimes, especially in politics, you gotta like take a leap and just hope it works out, whether it's a candidate or a campaign or a job. Mm -hmm. I like, I will definitely say that like, I was very fortunate to have grown up in the DC area. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was able to take some of those internships that like, I would not recommend someone move out of state to come take because you're not going to get paid. Like my parents worked in DC. They just dropped me off in the morning. Um, but when it came time to leave the nonprofit I was working at and go into fundraising, I took like a 20 K pay cut, um, to learn how to fundraise where Mm -hmm. my boss was like, I think you're going to be great at this, but you know, nothing. I cannot afford to pay you that much. Um, and I was making 50K at the former job and then was making about like 31K at mm-hmm. the fundraising job. Um, we should talk about that too. 
Yeah. The pay, it's, it's a jump. Like you go from scraps to like, there's not a lot of in between. Mm -hmm. Um, but that risk and I only, I ended up only working for her for about three and a half months, um, before going to the state party. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was worth it because people saw that I did fundraising on my resume and they were like, Oh, you know how to talk to people. You like, you'll be able to figure out political stuff because you've now done fundraising. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was able to just like keep building on it. Um, but I think if I was worried that I wouldn't, one, I lived at home, so I didn't have to worry about rent. Um, but I think if I looked at the opportunity and was like, how dare this person think that they like have like they're I'm worth more than 30K um, and skipped out on my opportunity, I wouldn't be where I am now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes in politics, you have to think about that long game. And I didn't realize it then, but like the salaries in politics, like it's a jump. Like mm -hmm. there's the in-between is just not there. And I think that's really unfortunate and something that I think we're trying to work on across the space. But it's like you go from being an organizer to being an RD and then you jump to like field director and it's like a, like you go from making 40 to like 90K. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definite, it was worth it. And yeah. I look back on those times and I'm like, you glad you did it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wasn't glad my friends would be like, hey, let's go get food. And I'm like, mm, going to eat at home tonight. Um, but now I'm like, Hey, let's go get food. Right. So. And that, that is a key piece. The salaries, um, in finance are, I mean, they can be meager in the beginning when you are a finance assistant. Um, you know, it, it is, you know, probably not going to be as much, but as you start progressing, um, and you get to the point where you can be like a deputy, finance director or a finance director, or like you move into the consultant space, you can then really set your own um, price within reason. Um, but, you know, you can, you can set your price based on a, your skill set, um, your experience, and also the level of where you are. So, you know, don't let that be a barrier to entry um, and don't let fear hold you back. I just implore everyone. We need more people in finance and fundraising, we need more women, we need more people of color. Um, we definitely do. So, you know, if it is something that is on your heart, um, or you just want to give it a try, do it. The only thing you can do is grow from it and then apply those lessons learned um, and all of the positives and definitely the negatives to the next situation, you know, to make it better for yourself as you decide to grow and thrive. And as I tell, uh, when I took that first fundraising job and I remember my boss asked me like, are you going to be comfortable asking people for money? I was like, I ask my parents for money all the time. And when they say no, I still ask them again. Um, and I think that was like the great mentality to bring into it. Like you're going to ask people for money. They're going to say Constantly. no. And then you're going to have to ask them again. Um, and that's really, honestly, that is the same across like all parts of, of the campaign political mm -hmm. world. You're going to ask people to vote for your candidate. They're going to say no. They're going to tell you a hundred horrible things about your candidate. And you're probably going to have to call them again in a month and a half and ask them again if they're going to vote for your candidate. Mm -hmm. So I think like fundraising, I remember the first campaign, it like, it was the people who wore like professional business suits while the field folks were wearing like jeans and a t-shirt. They were always heading out to events and coming back with like really good food. Um, and they were telling us about all the fancy people they were meeting. So it felt so intimidating. Like, how did they get to be on fundraising? Do they have like special degrees or do they like know the right people? And it's like, nope, like all of us can do it. You just gotta, just gotta ask. Yep. Closed mouths do not get fed. So that goes for dollars and that goes for positions. I mean, you just have to ask. Um, and all someone can tell you is no. Um, what do you think? Closing thoughts? What do you leave the people with, Michelle? Um, I would leave the people with uh, something that my brother told me a couple of years ago when I was starting to feel a little bit of imposter syndrome, where I was like, I don't know if I'm really like, should I be here? Why mm -hmm. am I here? Like, am I only getting hired places because I'm a, like, I'm a black woman and they just want like a little drop of color in the room. 
And my brother was like, Michelle, who cares? He was like, if you found like miraculously found your way into like a Grammy route, like a Grammy party and Beyonce was there and you knew you weren't supposed to be there, you're not going to like sit in the corner and be like, Beyonce's over there, but I'm not supposed to be here. So I'm not going to go try to get like a photo with Beyonce or like go hang out with Meg Thee Stallion. He's like, you're going to take advantage of the room that you're in and like worry about that stuff later. He's like, that's the same approach you have to have to this work. Um, I think we sometimes find ourselves so wrapped up and whether or not we deserve to be in the room, we forget that we're already in it. And it's on us to like take advantage of the room that we're in and do what we came there to do. Mm-hmm. Like who cares why someone put us in that room? That's their problem. I'm here. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to do what I need to do, whether it's in field where it's like, yeah, they might have hired me because I'm black, but I'm here now. So I'm going to make sure that we knock and turn out every person that I think needs to vote in this election. And we hear the opinions of every person who I think needs to be there. Maybe you hired me to fundraise because I'm a person of color. Great. I'm going to make sure that your donor base reflects the people in your district and isn't just like rich, wealthy, old white people from like five districts away because Mm -hmm. they're usually right checks. Like you're going to talk to people who live here who might only be able to give you $5 but who cares? And you're going to meet the wealthy people of color who like you weren't even sure could give you money. Mm -hmm. Uh, So like, just take advantage of where you are and don't let fear of why you're there be what stops you. I love that. Um, Yeah. I think everything you just said clearly um, and always push your candidate, push your candidate, push them hard. Um, Push them, push them, push them, push them beyond their comfort zone. When they say they only want to do 10 to 12 hours of call time a week, you remind them that you need them dialing 30 hours a week. (laughs) Call time should literally be every day, even if just for 45 minutes. They've got to knock it out. You've got to have those call sheets laid out. Um, Numero has a really great call time app. Um, Some people prefer a dialer. If they don't want all the information, they just want to call through people rapidly. Um, and just knock those calls out, but find what works best for you um, so that you can feel comfortable presenting whatever it is that's that tool to that person. Because at the end of the day, they're going to be looking at you and asking if they don't like it, why they need to continue using it. And at the end of the day, you don't want to be wasting money that can go to moving a message or doing something else when it's your job to actually continue bringing that money in. Um, So yeah. And also like, I think they're going to share all of our contact information So please, 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 please don't hesitate um, to reach out. Um, And we can actually, I don't know if they do, but I think they do it after because we can't actually type things directly to you all. Um, We just have a, we we don't have access to do that. Um, However, uh, you know, I think you can find us online, but I think it should be included, Michelle, hopefully. Hopefully. I think we're we're both on LinkedIn. Yes. So. Perfect. Oh, perfect. Um, you yeah, all should have to it. It's so good. Yeah. Definitely. Well, thank each and every one of you for joining us. We hope that this has been helpful um, and useful information. Um, we look forward to talking to you if you need anything from us directly moving forward. And um, let's go out there and raise some money. We have a big midterm coming up. Yes. Early money is like yeast. Yes. Uh, Trademarked by Emily's list. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. Thank you all so much. Thank you.